This is a recording of the 2024 Roscoe Ellis Jr. Lectureship in Soil Science, presented by Dr. Rattan Lau, a distinguished university professor and so of soil science and director of the CFAES Rattan Lau Center for Carbon Management and Sequestration at The Ohio State University. This presentation was given on March 26, 2024, at Kansas State University in the Department of Agronomy. The subject uh, that I suggested was sustainable agriculture and soil management or climate and food security. So I want to begin by explaining that agriculture has gone through four so-called revolutions. The number one revolution was uh, with the beginning of uh... Here it is. Off your slide. Okay. So oh, you did that. Okay. Not, not from here. Okay. Thank you. Try that. So uh, number one revolution was when the agriculture began, settled agriculture, about 10,000 years ago. And number two was 17th to 19th century when the mechanization began uh, and trade of agriculture products uh, happened. Uh, number third was the Green Revolution. Uh, and number four is what we call now uh, artificial intelligence and intelligent computers. So I'm going to briefly explain these circa 8,000 BC, when hunter-gatherer people adopted settled agriculture and found villages and towns and created social structures leading to arts, culture, and infrastructure. Evolution of agriculture, then of course, uh, the uh, involvement of bullocks and other uh, draft animals. But what I wanted to mention was this picture comes from about 3200 BC to 1900 BC Indus Valley civilization. Under a sand dune, buried, a plowed field, at that time plowing in rows, planting crops, and yet susceptible to soil erosion. Uh, and that's an important uh, discovery that this particular slide comes from British Museum. Uh, which is very remarkable that even bullock drawn implements plowing had that uh, issue uh, about 5,000 years ago. Then agriculture revolution number 2.0, mechanization of farm operation, uh, approximately 1750 to 1950 with use of heavy machinery and fossil energy based inputs, which increased the land area under agriculture. And then came the steam horse, of course, in 1910, and uh, expansion further of cropland area. Because of that, in 1700, we had 265 million hectare. In 1800, 573 million hectare. 1920, almost a billion hectare. And in 1950, 1170 million hectare. A tremendous expansion of cropland area happened, along with the increase in irrigated land under arid and semi-arid condition. Uh, 1800, we had only 8 million hectare. 1940, 1950, 100 million hectare. And uh, then, of course, the mechanite plowing, um, especially erosion problem, and it is not uh, on the contour, but up and down the slope. Uh, the dust bowl, as you know very well, uh, what happened in the 30s. Uh, as a result of that intensive tillage operation, most soils lost 25 to 75% of their original soil organic carbon pool, which is preferentially removed by erosion of both wind and water because its density is 0.6 gram per cubic centimeter rather than one of that of water and 2.65 that of uh, quartz. So very light fraction, preferentially removed by both wind and water. Should say something about the Green Revolution, that's number three, 3.0, and uh, it was between 1960 and 2020. The global population increased 2.5 times from 3.1 billion to 7.8 billion. The cereal production increased 3.3 times from 880 million to 2.9 billion tons. Uh, as you can see, the rate of population growth 
was lower than that of food production and the Malthus concept uh, was proven wrong. Uh, consequent of that higher rate of production than population, the per capita cereal production increased 32% from 284 kilogram to 380 kilogram. And this is what we would like to call uh, the Borlaug effect, uh, the miracle that saved uh, hundreds of millions of people from starvation, so rightfully called the Borlaug effect. It was caused, however, by intensive inputs. For example, the nitrogen fertilizer went up 9.2 times between 1961 and 2019 over the 60 year period. The phosphorus fertilizer went up five times. Potassium fertilizer also about five times. Pesticide use 5.2 times. Irrigated land area went up 2.4 times from 140 to 350 million hectare. And right now, the amount of water used for irrigation alone is 3,150 kilometer cube. That's 70% of the total water used by humanity. The land use uh, increased tremendously also from 1950 onward. Right now, the gross cropland area is 1,600 million hectare. The net is probably around 1,400 million hectare. And uh, at the same time, the grazing land area is 3.6 billion hectare, 3,600 million hectare. So the total area, both of cropland and grazing land, is about 5 billion hectare. Roughly 37% of the ice-free land is under agriculture. Irrigation went up also during that time from 1950 to present. In 1995, it was 250 million hectare, and at present, it's approaching about 375. So some 40% of the world's food is produced on 17% of the irrigated cropland area. So that is what the Green Revolution is. It certainly proved Malthus wrong, but there are certain other things that also happened. During that time, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere went up tremendously. In 1960, the carbon dioxide concentration was 315 parts per million. In, 19, in 2020, it was 416 parts per million. Over 60 year period went up by 100 parts per million, and it's going up tremendously. And uh, this morning I checked, uh, the latest I could find was 22nd of March 2024, and it's 425 parts per million. You can actually see it every day, but uh, how much it's going up. So it's tremendous now how much the maximum that can go before. Uh, the global warming would exceed 2 degrees centigrade is 560 parts per million. So if you take 560 at the upper limit, minus 425, and multiply by 2.14, some number, because that's the number of gigaton required to increase 1 parts per million, that comes to about 300 gigaton of carbon that can be emitted by humanity before global warming goes beyond two degrees centigrade. So the question is, how do you divide that 300 gigaton of carbon among 8 billion people over 200 countries? That's a very serious question which really requires very thorough discussions at international scale. Global warming indeed, uh, Anthropogenic Commission, account uh, for about 15% in terms of the uh, soil and agriculture. And the significant contribution comes from nitrous oxide and methane. Uh, nitrous oxide 310 times more potent than carbon dioxide and methane 21 times, which means uh, mitigation of nitrous oxide and methane is very critical. Nitrous oxide comes from fertilizers, cover crops and methane, of course, from uh, rice paddies and uh, cattle. Climate change has already increased uh, uh, the calorie, decreased the calorie production of food by 1% in 
and it is feared that by 2050, it may decrease by another 3.2. I'm not talking about here the grain production, I'm talking about the calorie production, which is the most uh, important factor to be considered. Another thing that in relation to global warming is soil degradation. And soil degradation and global warming are mutually reinforcing processes. Uh, soil degradation increases emission and uh, climate change also increases soil degradation. So it is a process which is mutually reinforcing and something to be seriously considered about. 33% of soil globally and more recent figure is that this number is pretty closer to 40% is highly degraded. 52% of agricultural land is moderately to severely degraded. And the cost of degradation globally is estimated by uh, IFPRI group at about $400 billion per year. But I think it's quite an underestimate because sometimes the irrigation and inputs, et cetera, masks the effect of degradation on productivity. Salinization is uh, especially the secondary salinization of irrigated land, about 1.5 million hectare of productive cropland are selenized every year. And I think the that gives us a message that the food you eat uh, has also effect on the human health because the food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. And the good food or poisonous food come from the soil on which they are grown. A healthy soil will produce healthy food mm -hmm. and a polluted contaminated soil will produce food which is not so healthy. And that one health concept uh, uh, we need to consider very, very carefully. In fact, uh, health of soil, plant, animal, human, environment, and the planet is one and indivisible. And this concept comes from John Muir, who said when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hits to everything else in the universe. And that's exactly what it is. And uh, when soil is degraded, uh, the human who live on it and history shows what happened to many extinct once thriving civilization is because they took their soil resources for granted. And this is a part that uh, we must consider that the health of human being and everything else depends on it. And in fact, what you can say is that the people are mirror image of the soil they live on. So when soils are degraded, people are in miserable shop. And when the people are miserable, they pass their misery to the soil. And this vicious cycle, unfortunately, continues. The resources used for agriculture, I already mentioned, 38% of terrestrial surface is used for agriculture. 75% of agriculture land is allocated to raising animals. 70% of global freshwater withdrawal, which is 3,150 kilometer cube, are used for irrigation. 30 to 35% of global greenhouse gas emissions are contributed by food system, not by agriculture. That I um, misquoted it here, by food system. Agriculture is one part of that. Half of these 30 to 35% come from agriculture. The remaining half from the remaining part of the food. And yet we have one in 10 person who is food insecure, 820 million out of 8 billion, that's one in 10. And two out of, uh, two billion out of 8 billion, one in four is malnourished. In fact, that figure one in four is underestimate because the number of people malnourished who do not have access to healthy and safe food is approaching 3 billion out of 8 billion. That brings us to the point of 4.0, agriculture 4.0. What is happening now? It involves the use of artificial intelligence, Raj, uh, very important work that you are doing and your, uh, your uh, staff, students. And this started since circa 2010, at least terminology, artificial intelligence. The work obviously has been going on for a while. It's driven by cyber physical systems or intelligent computers. That's the so-called digital agriculture revolution is driven by the urgency to change 
from performing, which is high productivity, through the artificial intelligence system to transforming, performing to transforming, of producing more from less. And that's the slogan. How can we do that green revolution? Remember 9.2 times nitrogen, five times phosphorus, 2.5 times irrigation, all those. And uh, do we need so much? And that's the question how to. So what are the transformative strategies? We have been doing deplete, degrade, destroy, discard, and dominate. Take things from nature. Five Ds. I think what we need to do is to change into something different, and that is reduce, reuse, recycle, regenerate, and restore so that we can return some land back to nature. That's really the solution. We took too much resources, and somehow uh, we need to return in spite of the fact that the population may go up. And I think that the innovation, what we can do, what this transformative agriculture, the use of sensors and robotics to collect field data and transmit to local or cloud servers via IoT for storage, processing, analysis, and undertaking appropriate decision via artificial intelligence using machine learning. And I don't need to read those. You know what that is. Uh, it's a system which is widely being used here, especially. And it's a transformation of agriculture by the use of soil and water sensors, camera, drone, satellite, automatic guided vehicles, and communication technology to arrive at a management decision. IoT sensors are used to obtain information on soil properties, climate parameters, and livestock sectors. And what happens is that we uh, do this technology to minimize uh, pollution by fertilizer, herbicide, pesticide, gaseous emission, soil erosion. I want to pause here for a moment. I'm not saying do not use those. That probably use those as medicine. And what the difference between medicine and poison is the dose and the time of application. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Using wisely a medicine is a good thing to do. So use it wisely, not excessively, not indiscriminately, then it becomes poison. So minimize this use and then increase productivity at the same time, producing more from less, running crop biomass, uh, many other yield estimates through AI, nutrition sensitive agriculture, reducing waste, and of course, protecting soil against erosion, against depletion of carbon, against uh, structural degradation. And then through the AI use, uh, it can use to agronomic focus, it can lead to ecological focus, and it will use to soil human health nexus. So this is the way I would see the future use of AI in terms of ecological focus, in terms of agronomic focus, and in terms of soil human health focus with the idea of protecting natural resources and returning some of those resources back to nature. I do want to keep emphasizing because many international organizations, I will not name them, they say we need another 500 million hectares by 2050. Absolutely not. We need to use properly what we produce and we need to use existing land resources wisely so we can return some back to nature. That is the solution to some of the issues. So what the technological innovations, space farming, uh, soil process under hypergravity, that's going to happen. The moon mission, almost four nations have already been there. So space farming will happen. Uh, AIs, robotics, soil-less agriculture. Soil is so precious that it cannot be used just for food production. It has many other uses. So using somehow aquaculture, aeroponics, hydroponics, precision agriculture, digital agriculture, the nexus approach, interconnectivity, nutrition-sensitive agriculture, micronutrient deficiency, which is a major problem, especially iron deficiency, problem, uh, children under five and nursing mother in developing countries everywhere. Uh, that it's not a matter of producing the highest yield, it's a matter of producing optimum yield with good nutrition density. And farming soil with plants that emit molecular-based signals for remote sensing and targeted intervention so that plant tell us, I'm being eaten by a grasshopper, I'm eaten by fungus, I'm dry, 
uh, any nutrients uh, through special molecular based signal. And of course, finally, farming carbon, which I'll come to that moment. Carbon is going to be a crop that we want to grow. And we adopt all those things through one health concept, that the health of soil, plants, animal, people, ecosystem, and the planet is one and indivisible. You cannot solve human health issue if the soil on which you are growing food is degraded. I think that will also bring us to rights of soil. Everybody believes that soil is a living entity. If soil is dead, nothing can be grown. So soil has to be living. And a healthy living soil has five metric ton of living biomass, earthworm, termites, centipede, millipede, microbes, other uh, micro and meso and macro animals. And therefore, this soil as a living thing must have rights. Just as universal rights of human, rights of animal, there must also be rights of soil and rights of nature at the essence of all life. Soils have rights to be protected, restored, thrive, and managed judiciously. Simply because you own a property does not mean that you can do with it what you wish. And that's what the rights of the soil mean. And prime agricultural land and ecologically sensitive ecoregion, especially against urbanization, they must be demarcated and protected. You cannot touch them. I think that has to happen, especially in highly dense uh, populated countries of South Asia and in Africa where the population is going up. Demarket the areas. This will not be encroached upon. It should be left only for nature and for agriculture and not for urbanization and industrialization. Therefore, the 21st century green revolution, if Borlaug was around to have to have it, that rather than variety-based, and fertilizer based and irrigation based, it must be soil based, soil resilience, soil health, soil equality, uh, soil uh, functions, uh, soil restoration. It must be ecosystem, eco efficiency, ecological efficiency. The nitrogen efficiency should be much higher. The fertilizer use efficiency, irrigation efficiency, excessive water being used, which is going to become problem. 70% of all water being used to irrigate 375 million hectares of cropland. Somewhere something's gone wrong. Why not drip irrigation? Why not drip fertigation? So that we combine water and nutrient together and give it to the plant roots in drop by drop when needed, not otherwise. And knowledge-based, science and management driven. And that brings us to the question of uh, regenerative agriculture. What is it? Everybody talks about it, regenerative agriculture. It's no one technology. It's a concept. It's an idea. It's a strategy. It's an approach. And it's an approach which is inspired by eco-innovation. It's powered by non-carbon energy. It's driven by a circular economy and green infrastructure. But it's supported by the recarbonization of the terrestrial biosphere as the bedrock of sustainable development. Why recarbonization? We lost almost 600 billion tons of carbon from the terrestrial biosphere since 10,000 years ago. Imagine if we can put even half of it back. That's why any regenerative agriculture, if it does not recarbonize the soil and the landscape, and if it does not permit us to return land back to nature, we must take it back to the ground table to check what is happening. And the soil organic matter is the essential soil health and is the elixir of life. Elixir term comes from Arabic term al aksir the essence of life. And that's what it is. That brings me to the question of uh, uh, the policy issues. We do have Clean Air Act, EPA, 1967. We do have a Clean Water Act, 1972. I submitted that we can never have clean air and clean water if our soils are degraded and depleted, contaminated and destroyed. Therefore, it's perhaps time to consider carefully Soil Health Act. And many times farmers are concerned, will the Soil Act give them uh, punishment for doing something? No, the Soil Health will, should have, will have positive language. Thou shall be rewarded for adopting better agricultural practices and restoring uh, soil quality and soil health 
for example, for ecosystem services such as carbon sequestration, improving water quality and renewability, increasing biodiversity. Uh, farmers should be rewarded for doing those. And soil organic matter content improvement also brings uh, saving in nitrogen, for example. Uh, each additional percent of organic matter in soil, we should calculate how much nitrogen can be saved because we are not uh, causing leaching losses or denitrification by one way or the other. Uh, what the cost of that saving uh, if kilogram of nitrogen is so much uh, and that price keeps on changing, but you can calculate that. Water saving in the roots, and I said 70% of all water is being used for irrigation and that too hardly 20% uh, or so of the area or less. So increasing soil organic carbon content 1% on mass basis uh, can increase the plant available water holding capacity. That's a good research to calculate. If you increase organic matter content, how much water holding capacity increase between wilting point and the field capacity? Uh, there are some estimates that indicate that there is a, and that finally brings me to the issue of farming carbon. The idea of farming carbon is just like you grow corn, you grow wheat, uh, you grow beef or dairy, uh, cotton or whatever, you grow carbon so that it becomes a commodity. And commodity means you can get income from it. And that would be farming carbon. So the growing soil carbon as a farm commodity that can be traded, bought and sold or create another income stream. That's what it means. So how much price should the farmer be paid? That's really very interesting question. You, There are many companies and I don't need to name any, uh, there are quite a few, uh, and some of them are globally, and many more are emerging. It's it's really a very era of uh, carbon trading companies uh, at the moment, and I would simply warn the farmers uh, that uh, be careful. Some companies are definitely very, very good, but be careful. The buyers, be careful what you're buying. So 2010 prices, I calculated it, uh, and I calculated by taking the price of A, going a cover crop, the price of... Uh, uh, what is involved in this, uh, and then additional nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and other nutrients required to convert crop residue into humus. Crop residue cereals have a CN ratio of about 100. Humus has a CN ratio of 10. So it's enriched in nitrogen. The same thing applies to phosphorus and sulfur. So even if you apply residue, but there are no nutrients, uh, CO2 will be mineralized and gone into the atmosphere. Uh, or it may be in worst case CH4, but not become a humus. So you require additional nutrient. Therefore, the price of nutrient must be accounted for uh, in that price as well. So I calculate this price $120. It's published in, a, in the journal uh, per ton of carbon. And that means per ton of CO2, you can multiply 120 by 12 and divide by 44. So you can get uh, the price uh, per credit, which come to about $35 in 2010 prices. The current prices of the everything in Chicago climate, uh, Chicago market, it would come to about $150 to $200 per ton of carbon, which means about $40 to $54 per credit or per ton of CO2, which is $50 per credit. So if a farmer adopts a better practice, whatever that better word might mean, site specific, it's different or regenerative practice and they sequester one credit of carbon dioxide and that can be verified, they got $50 extra. And I hope Farm Bill will have that provision. Soil Health Act will have that provision. That's what I'm talking about. So if there's a two credit per hectare, that's $100 per hectare. Where will that money come from? No idea. But I think in general, it should be consumer paid. The consumer has to pay. Eventually, we have to pay for it, but not the farmers. If we expect farmers should do it, they will not do it. I don't see why should they do it. So we should let them know what carbon farming mean. And I hope that uh, I've been telling everybody uh, through IUSS and other company, we need two classes uh, in all agricultural uh, institution. One health concept taught by multidisciplinary people and carbon farming concept how to make carbon a commodity that farmer can grow on their land and get income for it. That's also a multidisciplinary project. If soils are managed properly, globally, if capitalized, 
uh, which I hopefully will happen. The technical potential, I think, of carbon sequestration in all sides of the world is about two and a half gigaton of carbon per year. But even half of that would be very good. And there are several estimates. Uh, some of them come close to this, others not. But there's a range. It's very difficult to come to a one value. Now, if you calculate what can be done between now and 2100, the amount of carbon that can be put in the soil total over the next 20 uh, eight year period between now and say 21 eight year period, uh, 178 gigaton of carbon, petagram, billion ton. In vegetation, afforestation of all degraded land, and that's what I meant returning land back to nature. So let the vegetation grow, another 155. So if everything is done properly and farmers are given pro nature, pro agriculture, and pro farmer policy, to give them $50 per credit, it is technically possible to take from the atmosphere 330 gigaton of carbon, which translates into 157 parts per million of CO2. So it's all health act to happen. If the farm bill has these provision, if farmers are incentivized, the technical potential says that if the fossil fuel is stopped, we find other sources of energy, and if we promote land-based sink through agricultural sustainable practices, keeping global warming two degrees centigrade or even to 1.5 degrees centigrade is still possible. But there is no tomorrow. You can't say we'll do it 10 years from now. Let's burn for more 10 years. No, stop that, find alternative, and then land can become a solution to mitigate the climate change. Now, then the final question arises, how are you going to meet the food demand by 2050? I believe we produce enough food already for, to feed 10 billion people. Now, 10 billion we are going to have by probably 2050 or uh, soon thereafter. We already produce more than 3 billion tons of grain, but 1 billion tons of grains reach no stomach, human or animal. They are wasted. So one, why waste? I can realize that 40%, uh, 30% waste uh, is... Uh, completely out of question, but 5% perhaps acceptable. Some waste is going to happen because the biodegradable material we are talking about, but still through education, through better system, and not taking food for granted is one option. So reduce waste, which is very critical. Increase access to food by addressing poverty, inequality, wars. War causes hunger, and I'll come back to that uh, at the end. And of course, the political instability. Improving distribution, increasing use of policies and plant-based diet. Today in discussion, we are talking about uh, biofortification of mung beans and wood beans, a very important approach. That does not mean don't eat meat, no. Eat in moderation, but uh, focus on plant-based diet, especially in developing countries such as uh, China and India and Africa. Accepting personal responsibility. Why personal? Each one of us is a culprit and victim both. Therefore, we have responsibility. And uh, increasing agronomic productivity from existing land, restoring degraded lands, increasing biological nitrogen fixation by legume, and converting some agricultural land for nature conservancy without any new conversion of land back to, and using land through sustainable intensification. And that is the only way it's going to produce, 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 waste, 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 throw, throw, throw. That's not an option. No additional appropriation of land or water. Now, this is a picture from Punjab and a nice uh, outing. Uh, again, the population uh, and these different color indicate you uh, the brown uh, agriculture 2.0, the green agriculture 3.0, the blue agriculture 4.0. And I left the purple, you know, that's your uh, color here. Uh, that means good thing can happen everywhere, like here. So I think education of the women is very critical. This population 11.2 can actually be around 8.6 if we have women empowered to make sure their destiny is in their own hand. 
and that will bring it a control. And when the population come down to 8.6 rather than 11.2, and you adopt those food habits which are pro-nature and pro-health, return back land to nature, sustainable development goals can still be achieved. Over the last 10,000 years, the number of humans has increased tremendously. And uh, I think something can be done so that the impact by PAT, that's P is population, A affluence, T technology, that impact of humanity on the planet can be reduced by uh, controlling the population and by educating the population and making sure that uh, the land returning back to nature by 2100 is really the goal. And that goal I have been recommending to several organizations, uh, including UN and FAO and others. And here is something which is not many people agree, but I think this is an option that agricultural institution should think about very carefully and teach about it. Fertilizer. We now use 200 million tons of it in 2020. If we improve soil health that I was talking about, over time, by 2030, by 2050, by 2100, the amount of fertilizer used should know more than one fourth of what it is now. Improve the efficiency. The efficiency of fertilizer in India and China is 30% maximum. And use of fertilizer rate, I won't give you what the number there is. It's among us. But yes, we do need fertilizers. Irrigated land area, we have 350 million hectare. We should have about 500 million hectare by 2100. But at the same time, the amount of water use should decrease by using drip irrigation. Cropland area, we have 700, 1500 million hectare. We do not need more than half of that, 750 million hectare. Progressively decrease. Conservation agriculture, only 200 million hectare. It should be all cropland area under conservation agriculture by 2100. Again, Soil Health Act would uh, give that grazing land area. We definitely need care. We definitely need uh, animal-based protein. Uh, but we need to do that in such a way that we do not need 3.7 billion hectare of land under that. I think we could certainly, some land is designed to be only for uh, rangeland and cattle management. But 3.7 billion hectare, no should be 1.5. So here I'm talking about uh, reducing the cropland area and grazing land area by half. I'm reducing water use from 3,150 kilometer cube, which is through furrow irrigation and flood irrigation and sprinkler to drip fertigation using micro irrigation system, bring the water use to one third and the global cereal yield on a global scale from four metric ton should go up to eight metric ton per hectare. It's possible. Africa right now, average is one to one and a half million uh, metric ton per hectare. It should be very easily seven to eight uh, metric ton by proper management. Therefore, the mantra is uh, healthy soil equal to healthy diet, equal to healthy people, equal to healthy ecosystem, equal to healthy planetary processing. That's the basis. Now, finally, I do want to say, say something about soil degradation by heavy machinery. And this heavy machine is very different. I won't name where it is used and why, but uh, it is something which is important to say that soil is the major victim of any war. Nobody talks about it, but that's a fact. And as a soil scientist, I think it will be a great mistake not to mention the degradation of soil by that kind of machinery and what that machinery delivers to the soil. Global peace is not just a political issue. It's a scientific issue. Advancing science of soil health, nutrition sensitive agriculture, food processing and biofortification are critical and high priority scientific issues with a strong impact on world peace and stability because the fire that burns in the pit of an empty stomach is so harsh that it can only be quenched by a piece of bread made from grains grown on a healthy soil and nothing else. Those patent tanks and those missiles cannot control it. 
they serve as aggravator of that fire. Human, inhuman actions are the major cause of death by hunger and malnutrition because access to food is used as a weapon. I don't need to read you where that is being used as a weapon right now. Access to food as a weapon is a serious problem globally, but we don't want to talk about it. And that is the weapon of mass destruction which is killing how many people are hunger globally. And we as a scientist who produce food and healthy food have a part to play in it. Therefore, peace is not just a political issue. It's not being addressed by politicians alone. And as a scientific community, we have a duty, moral duty. Therefore, as far as famines and wars are concerned, famines like wars, are also human-made tragedies. They are human-made tragedies. It doesn't matter how you look at it. Therefore, we must make famines, wars, and mass starvation politically intolerable, morally toxic, ethically unthinkable, and humanly unacceptable. Thank you.